This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. It's really my distinct pleasure to introduce the speaker of Grand Rounds today, who's a great friend and a leader in pediatrics, and that is Dr. Donna Ferrero, who is the WH and Marie Waters Distinguished Professor of Pediatrics, Chair of the Department of Pediatrics and Physician-in-Chief of the UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital. She's also a professor of neurology and a member of the biomedical sciences graduate program there. She's the director of the neonatal brain disorder laboratories and co-director of the newborn brain research institute at UCSF. Dr. Ferrero got her MD from UCSF, completed her postgraduate residency and fellowship trainings in pediatrics, neurology, and developmental neurobiology at Tufts, Harvard and UCSF respectively. She has extensive laboratory experience and is the PI of multiple grants from NINDS for over the past two decades. Over the past years, her research has focused on the pathobiology of hypoxic ischemic injury in the developing nervous system. Just to give you a feel for her other assets, she was recognized by the university and by her residents as an outstanding teacher, received the UCSF Academic Senate Distinguished Teaching Award, the Robert Laser Neurology Teaching Award, the UCSF Chancellor's Award for the Advancement of Women, the Maureen Andrew Mentor Award from the Society for Pediatric Research, was elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences, the Association of American Physicians, and most recently in 2013 to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She has authored almost 250 publications and is a frequently invited speaker at various settings. So the title of her talk today is The Newborn with a Vulnerable Brain, a 21st Century View of Neuroprotection and Repair, Dr. Ferrero. Thank you, Sharon. I told her not to say all that stuff. I have to shorten my biography. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, what I want to do in the next 45 minutes or so is tell you about the advances in therapies for the newborn, both premature and term newborn. And I'll weave between preclinical and clinical studies in that regard and show you how how advanced we've become in this 21st century. And then I want to end up telling you a little bit about measuring repair using neuro neuroimaging the, and mapping the connectome. And finally, I want to tell you a little bit, uh, a little bit of bragging about our neurologic intensive care nursery and how we do it, uh, co-manage our patients with neonatology, uh, because we've come a long way. When I was a trainee, we used to get kicked out of the nursery, so we're very happy to be uh, part of that. So I just want to uh, reiterate that this is a huge problem. We're dealing with over um, a million deaths each year. And the United States is high on that list, and probably because of our multiples and extremely uh, low birth weight infants. So let me start with a case. I was asked to start with a case. So this case, in really illustrates what a huge window of opportunity we have in pediatrics. You know that when an adult has a stroke, we have less than four hours to get them to the hospital, give the TPA, treat them, and then we're done. 
For the baby, however, it's a much different story because the injury is evolving over a long period of time. So we actually have a huge window of opportunity. So this is a baby who had a difficult delivery, vacuum extraction, skull fracture, term big baby, and was encephalopathic at birth. And then around six to eight hours of life developed focal clonic seizures. And the neurologists and epileptologists in this audience know that if a baby has focal seizures, it's probably a focal lesion that is a stroke. And stroke occurs in one in probably 2,800 live births. It's a huge problem, unrecognized problem, and more common than stroke in the elderly, yet very few. Uh, the portfolio of NINDS wouldn't um, show those uh, studies being funded as highly. But take a look at this. <clears throat> MRI. So here's day one all the way to day eight. And you can see a little bit of diffusion change and then it pseudo normalizes by day eight. And I think you can best see by the flare here or even the T2 where you don't see much on the first day right after the stroke. But, but by a week of life, this infant has evolved into quite a lesion. <laughs> and we're doing nothing about that. But we know this is evolving over a long period of time. And at least from animal models, we know that timing is everything in trying to affect this uh, process. Because initially, if we know it's happening, and we don't usually know when a stroke's happening, we do know when there's a sentinel event in a newborn with placental abruption, we'll have oxidative stress and excitotoxicity that occurs within hours that we could possibly do something about. And I'm gonna show you some studies aimed against those. But look at how long inflammation goes on. Look at how long cell death goes on. And it's not until days and weeks that repair starts to happen. So why can't we focus on some later processes in terms of neuroprotection? And I'm gonna show you <clears throat> a study that we did that proves that later treatment could actually prove to be better and help the repair process. So the biggest advance in the 21st century is therapeutic hypothermia for term hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. It's standard of care now. Um, here at UCLA, do you use whole body cooling? both whole body and cool cap. So we rely on encephalopathy, but we're not so great at recognizing encep encephalopathy. So we may be missing some babies, and we certainly are missing the strokes if they're not encephalopathic, and they may benefit from this, although we don't know that. There are studies trying to answer the question if we could treat later because these babies are enrolled by six hours of life and cool for 72 hours. But the network, NICHD network, now has a, in a later enrollment. And we really don't know who should be excluded. Maybe a baby with a chromosomal disorder and hypoxia ischemia should be treated with therapeutic hypothermia. That, that, brain malformation shouldn't bump them out of the study, which it usually does in most centers. So there have been five large randomized clinical trials with uh, follow-up now past eight years. And I'm gonna show you, these are the list of those bigger studies. And here's a Cochrane review just from last year. And this chart is looking at major developmental disability in survivors of hypothermia. And you could see um, you, without having to read all of these lines, regardless of whether you use selective head cooling or whole body cooling, um, that uh, the, uh, uh, the benefit is in favor of therapeutic hypothermia as outlined in red. And strikingly, the number needed to treat is only seven 
that is a very few number of babies to get therapeutic effect. I'd like to share with you our UCSF experience. Hypothermia definitely has reduced brain injury by MRI. And if we look at this carefully, we can see if just looking at patterns of injury, we know that when you have a severe term event like placental abruption, you're gonna hurt those basal ganglia, the deep gray nuclei get wiped out. And that's very, that ends up in spastic quadriplegia. Watershed injury is probably due to prior insults, maybe in utero fetal, fetal hypoxemia. We don't impact that as well, but we certainly shift the pattern of injury to normal in the hypothermic babies, and you can see that right here. And we shift away from that basal ganglia injury. So in follow-up, we're seeing babies who are looking quite well with a reduced amount of motor disability. The other interesting thing that we're seeing, and I don't know if you're seeing that here, is a reduction in seizures in these babies. And we monitored the babies for the first four days of life through the cooling and rewarming period. And the hypothermic babies are not seizing, which is also great news. So this is a complicated slide, but I want to just show you with all those little black dots that there are multiple arms of this cascade that occur over a long period of time that we could actually get to um, in different trials. So people have tried to do this, and now there's a RAP model that's been used for probably two, three decades called the Venucci model, where the carotid is tied off and, and the animal is placed in a a global hypoxic environment for a specified period of time. And that results in an ipsilateral to the carotid ligation infarct in those animals. And using that model, people have shown with giving different drugs different effects. Now here with allopurinol, there was some efficacy using the RAM model, but when they looked at babies, humans with birth asphyxia, <clears throat> there was no improvement in either short or long-term outcomes if the drug was given after birth. There was some mild benefit in the cardiac population, the hypoplastic left heart babies. So this made people think maybe we're giving the drug too late into that reperfusion injury. So there's an allo trial going on in Europe right now. It's randomized double blind. They identify the women with um, uh, tococardiograms for suspected uh, fetal distress. The moms get the allopurinol and they're following the babies. Uh, the data from that study isn't out yet, but so far it's still ongoing, so there are no serious adverse events. There are many other antioxidant strategies that we can uh, focus on, but just for the sake of not running a laundry list, I wanna focus on some promising uh, um, non-toxic used compounds in humans, and that's melatonin, and we'll focus on EPO and a little bit on acetylcysteine. So going back to that stroke model, melatonin didn't decrease that stroke that was seen after the ligation when either one or two doses were given after the insult. But there was a massive decrease in inflammation, so the melatonin treated looked like controls, um, and in myelination uh, repair uh, was improved in the melatonin <laughs> brain. So what this says is you don't have to have an absolute reduction in the damage to get functional and potentially widespread 
um, improvement in outcome. So function does not follow form in the newborn brain. So a melatonin observational study in premature babies and term babies has just been completed in Paris. Um, their hypothesis is that premature babies especially are deficient in melatonin, and that deficiency sets them up for further damage at uh, um, challenge times, and that data will be presented soon. There's also a study in Australia at Monash looking at intrauterine growth restricted babies. Melatonin here again, trying to target that oxidative stress that occurs at birth earlier by giving the drug to mom. So the melatonin is given during pregnancy and they'll do a composite neonatal outcome. Many of you know about the Beaton trial, antenatal magnesium. So magnesium probably works by blocking the N-methyl-D-aspartate receptor, thus blocking glutamate release and reducing excitotoxicity early. Magnesium didn't reduce the risk in the composite outcome, but when they looked separately, they saw a reduction in cerebral palsy as well as a reduction in moderate to severe cerebral palsy. And the best news was it didn't increase the risk of death or disability. Every time we do these trials, especially with the therapeutic hypothermia, we were worried that we would reduce mortality, but then just make a whole bunch of spastic quads with the treatment that we would survive the babies and not improve. But in none of these studies are we seeing this. The number needed to treat a one case of cerebral palsy is high though, 56, compared to seven for therapeutic hypothermia. This is a study I just wanted to take a minute to describe because it's a fascinating study. They used a rabbit model of Neuroinflammation, so they inject the pregnant mom's uterus with E. coli. It sets up a massive inflammatory response, which is known to cause cerebral palsy in humans and in these animal models. N-acetylcysteine was coupled with a dendrimer, which allowed it to penetrate the brain better, and when they looked at the incidence of cerebral palsy, even though it was quite early. They looked at day one and day five. This is just a single dose to reduce oxidative stress in an inflammation model. They're not treating the E. coli, they're treating the brain of the baby who is experiencing inflammation. And look at this effect. There's a beautiful dose-dependent effect on day five. So. These are potential therapies that are still preclinical, but tell us there's lots to do and a lot of ways to get at this in this cascade of events. My favorite is erythropoietin. We've been studying this for the past decade. It's a pleiotropic hormone and safely used in babies, especially premature babies, as you all know. The nice thing is EPO and EPO receptor uh, expression occurs in the newborn brain. It is induced by hypoxia through hypoxia-inducible factor. And in neonatal ischemia models has shown preclinically to provide protection. I'll just show you quickly one study, which uh, Fernando Gonzalez did at our place. This was actually a stroke model. So we actually advanced a suture up the internal carotid, hold it at the bifurcation of the middle cerebral artery for a period of time, do an MRI to make sure there's injury, withdraw it and then give EPO. Now the interesting thing here is with a single dose of EPO, we saw immediate perfection, uh, protection at two weeks. But then when we went and looked later, we had lost that protective effect, telling us this injury continues to evolve even past two weeks. 
But when we gave the EPO immediately, a day later and seven days later, where preclinically there's a change of EPO expression in astrocytes and neurons, we saw <clears throat> this protection. And when we did the functional studies, Mars water maze and a number of animal um, cognitive tests, we could not tell the difference between the EPO treated with three doses, animals, and the sham animals. And when we sacrificed those animals, some of them still had injury, not as bad as the vehicle, but there was still injury there, but the function was improved. And when we started to dig down as to why and ask, are we really repairing the brain or just trying to protect or salvage? <laughs> We labeled cells, we give a lentivirus on day one of life, do the injury on day 10 of life in these rats, and then look at them at that time or uh, a week or two later. And we look for newly developing migrating neurons, double cordon, and the GFP is the label that allows us to see where it's going. And when we looked in the most injured part, the ipsilateral striatum, we saw that the occluded animals that were treated with EPO compared to their uh, vehicle treated animals had a, a big shift of neurogenesis. So we were shifting away from scar and shifting toward getting those newly born cells to the area of damage. We also saw, interestingly, an increase in those cells in the non injured brains as well. So maybe we could all get smarter. Maybe we should test Lance Armstrong and see if he uh, is smart. So uh, picking up on this preclinical data, Yvonne Wu designed a phase one study that was published in, in uh, September online 2012, and she showed very nicely a number of things. She showed that EPO plus hypothermia, and I'll interject that you can't give a newborn, encephalopathic newborn, anything without using hypothermia arm. So we couldn't have an EPO-only arm because of hypothermia being standard of care at this time. So EPO and hypothermia was well tolerated in these encephalopathic newborns. She found through pharmacokinetic modeling that 1,000 units per kilo IV closely mimicked the effects we saw in our animal studies, so far there's been very favorable follow-up. We're past 12 months now in some of these babies. There were no deaths and a reduction actually in this group compared to our hypothermia group of motor abnormalities. And we saw this shift in um, damage on the head MRI, but we don't really know how much of that is attributable to the hypothermia and how much it's attributable to EPO. And so now Yvonne has designed a phase two study where they're actually going to look more carefully at the MRI, the EEG, and hopefully get to a phase three soon. So there's extensive preclinical support for term HIE, including new primate data from Sunny Jewel that I haven't included in this talk. Small human trials are suggestive of benefit. There was a study in China and in Egypt, not with hypothermia, just with the EPO, both small studies so showing short-term benefit and safety. It appears to be safe especially if you keep, and these babies get multiple doses over the first week of life, so just like the animal studies. And there are ongoing studies right now. There's one in Paris, which is a phase three. Mariana Baserga at Utah is um, looking at Darbo Poetin, which is a derivative of EPO, more stable plus hypothermia, and then Yvonne's phase two uh, trial. So lots on the horizon in terms of that potential therapy. 
So what about if we think it, about it this way? Since hypothermia is already standard of care, why don't we start looking in animal models and in humans uh, of whether the combination, if you will, cocktails and ice actually improves things. And we actually have some serendipitous data about this. So this wasn't designed as a hypothermia plus trial, but what happened in this trial run by George Simbruner in Europe was that uh, um, some of the cohort received morphine and some of the cohort didn't. So we routinely use morphine to reduce shivering and stress. In this trial, not all the centers did. But when they looked at their data, the babies who received hypothermia with morphine uniformly did better than the babies who only had hypothermia. So that suggests there's something to it. Nikki Robertson in the UK has used a piglet model to look at melatonin, which I told you earlier might have beneficial effect in hypothermia. And using her piglet asphyxia model, she showed that hypothermia plus melatonin improved function by the amplitude integrated EEG, improved it, uh, excuse me, improved metabolism using spectroscopy in this time the hypothermia plus melatonin uh, um, uh, decreased uh, uh, the lactate, which is what we want to happen in our asphyxiated babies in the thalamus, the basal ganglia, and also reduced cell death when she actually sacrificed the animal. So again, in blue, a reduction, especially in those deep gray nuclei. Another interesting drug, if you will, is xenon. Xenon's noble gas. It can be used as an anesthetic in the mom. It's very expensive to use. There's a wonderful preclinical data from Mariana Thorson and others. Here's the preclinical data showing a gender effect, which is important but also an effect of xenon plus hypothermia, even with delayed treatment in different regions. The important thing here is that you could give this drug to the mom who is threatening labor and use it as an anesthetic for the mom, but it could end up being beneficial to the baby. Mariana Thorson is actually using xenon in term asphyxiated babies, and I think she's just enrolled 20 babies, no adverse events. It's a phase one study, so we can't say anything yet about efficacy, but something to keep our ears open for. Um, there was a paper written in JPEDS a while back showing a whole host of best candidates, and I've told you a little bit of some of them, but the idea being that you can use these drugs antenatally and postnatally for effect. And the important thing is that people are doing this, and there are multiple clinical trials ongoing right now. So we have a trial with inhaled xenon at Imperial and Mariana Thorson's trial in Bristol. We have Darby that I told you about, Mariana Basurga's nerve growth factor, a pilot study of head cooling in preterm babies, uh, cord blood cells, which I am not going to talk uh, much about, but I'm happy to answer questions about that, mag sulfate, EPO, and uh, delayed um, hypothermia, all ongoing. So is there any way other than following children with serial exams, MRI, and neurologic exams to say that we're actually repairing the brain? So we've been trying to look at this using diffusion-weighted imaging in our cohort by studying what we call the connectome. So what is the connectome? It's actually 
a network of connections in our neural systems, we can see on a microscopic level our synaptic function, but obviously we can't do that in vivo. But we can look using diffusion MRI at this beautiful interaction of connections in the brain, not tracks, but really things like clusters or modules and path length between those uh, modules. So we can look for the modules and see how well the brain is segregating function or cluster <laughs> coefficient. And we can look as the brain develops to see how rapidly that communication develops uh, by measuring path length, and that's called integration. So we can see complexity at multiple levels. So our hypothesis is that network properties of the baby connectome depend on the developmental stage and can be altered by injury and thus also can show whether there's any improvement after injury. So here's uh, some pictures to just to illustrate how we're measuring this. We do the anatomic MR images, and you could see the challenge here. As many of you who do imaging know, the preterm brain, small, full of water, compared to the adult brain. Tractography can give us these beautiful pictures, and from the tractography, we can map out these um, clusters, nodules, and measure path length. And Olga Tim Timovieva at UCSF, a brilliant postdoc working with Zwan Du, has looked at the maturation of the baby connectome and recently published this work in PLOS One. And this is preliminary data because it's just a few babies that we've done this in so far. And she sees a negative correlation in the clustering, but it reverses in the adult. So this tells us there's some pruning of these connections. These are the normal babies without MRI damage. And the characteristic path length increases early during development and then tightens up as the brain's nodules get, modules get closer together. But what she's seen now looking at the babies that have been injured, that both these clusterings, the modules, and the path length seem to be affected in the babies who have brain injury with a trend to declining brain network integration and segregation with less clustering and increased path length. So, these are provocative <laughs> preliminary data. So I want to spend the last uh, five minutes or so telling you a little bit about our clinical operation and toot our horn a little bit because it's taken many years to get to this point. So it's not just enough to sit down at the bench and kind of come up with drugs that might work. We have to figure out how to take care of babies at risk. We have to design brain-focused care that involves everybody, from the parent to the bedside nurse to the attending neonatologist to all the consultants involved in the baby's care. So we asked, how can we improve outcomes in PREMS and those at risk of neurological injury? And at our place, we consider every premature baby at risk for neurologic injury. They've got a long time to spend in that unit, get infected, get hypoxemic, et cetera. So we developed a neurointensive care nursery to do this. One of the biggest focuses that kind of pulled us together was cooling. So around the uh, uh, um, initiation of therapeutic hypothermia in our unit back in 2006, we were able to design teams and protocols to help these babies. And this 
has been amazingly fruitful. And as you all know, hypothermia has reduced death and disability by at least 11% and probably a lot more. So we kind of look at this uh, neuro neurocritical care as a multi-armed approach. So the partners are, it starts in the nursery. We have dedicated neurology team focused on problems of the newborn. We have neuroradiology that partners with us to help us monitor these babies and follow these babies. And also to try to do research to explore new directions in therapy. We do think all the time about neurotherapy and we have preclinical studies like our EPO studies and clinical studies like Yvonne Wu's NEDO trial. And most importantly, we have developmentally appropriate infant care. And this has this was quite a struggle to get to because we're all a bit of uh, control freaks, if you will, and get a little nervous when the parents are around. But having the parents be involved and provide with us developmentally appropriate care has made a huge difference. This all started and could not have been possible without specialized nursing. Sue Peliquin at our place, that's not Sue in the picture, it's somebody else, but she basically organized the nurses, provided a teaching program and protocols for nursing care that made the nurses uh, feel competent and involved at the bedside. So we have now over 30 trained nurses. There are, some of them are cross-trained with ECMO. There are always at least two present per shift, and many of them have attended formal lecture training, but I think it's the bedside that really manages. So they're great at rapid triage initial clinical assessment, applying the cooling blanket. And most importantly, it's the nurse who puts on the amplitude EEG. The nurses are trained to read that AEG and call the physician if they're worried about pattern changes. So in the co-management model, neonatology obviously stabilizes the patient and pays careful attention to hearts and lungs. And neurology pairs up to look at the baby and try to manage things that might not have been managed previously. And I can tell you so many times, and you guys know it in neurology, you see a baby in the nursery who is absolutely quiet. You put on that EEG and the baby's in status epilepticus. There's not a clinical sign. There's no, sometimes there's apnea, sometimes there's bradycardia, but sometimes there's nothing. So it's that ability to monitor the baby that I think is making a difference. When we, co by co-management, I mean we do daily rounds together. So we have an identified cohort of neurologists who call themselves hung the shingle neonatal neurologist. We staff the nursery. We round with the um, neonatologists every morning at 9.30. Painfully for me, I have to listen to all those I and O's and respiratory things. And painfully for them, they likewise have to hear the boring details of the EEG and the neurologic exam. And we've totally done away with moves all fours. That doesn't exist anymore. We do decision making together. Uh, sometimes we'll look at the exam together. We interpret together the AEG. And we all communicate with the family. And it's been very nice for the family to meet the neurologist in the nursery <laughs> instead of three months later as a first visit in the outpatient clinic. So. It, the wheels turn because we have this unit. We have 24-7 resources. This did not happen overnight. 
This was quite a struggle getting 24-7 EEG coverage, technicians, machines. And we now have developed standardized guidelines for our units. And we have <clears throat> protocols for hypothermia, for brain monitoring, seizure management, stroke evaluation, and imaging guidelines. So if I attend one week, my seizure management is going to match the attending who comes in the following week. So that, that baby is consistently being treated the same way. And those treatments have come about through consensus. So Terry Inder uh, published this very nice uh, piece that said, think about this. Has the child suffered brain injury? Is the brain adapting to illness? Does the infant need neurologic evaluation? Is the baby having seizures? If you can answer yes to any of those questions, you need to monitor the baby. And every baby should have an AEG just like they should have a pulse ox, is our way of thinking. We do video EG because it's the gold standard. It's difficult, it's expensive, it requires trained technicians and experienced epileptologists to read. The amplitude integrated EEG is much more friendly to all of us. We can apply it at the bedside, track trends, and at the same time realize it has a low sensitivity for picking up a seizure, so it's increasing our um, vigilance and awareness, but doesn't tell us the baby is having seizures all the time. So we monitor when the baby has high risk for seizures, like HIE, circulatory arrest, encephalitis, stroke, hemorrhage, or errors of metabolism that cause cerebral edema. If the baby's paralyzed and sometimes in the preterm babies who aren't behaving properly. We know that there's there is absolute beautiful data, and this is a summary from Mariana Thorson, that the AEG can be quite predictive of good health. So if a bad AEG normalizes within 24 hours of life, that baby has probably a better than 90% chance of being normal. That's an incredible biomarker. The presence and absence of sleep-wake cycling on that AEG is also a very good indicator of outcomes. So if you don't see sleep-wake cycling, you're dealing with a very sick brain. So I hope in these 45 minutes I've shown you that there are many ways to achieve neuroprotection. We have a huge amount of time and we should have a thirst for trying to figure out how to apply these things. We know hypothermia is standard of care, and we think that the best strategies are going to be targeting multiple mechanisms. We think advanced MR techniques can help us decide who is repairing, if we can use them appropriately. And we think that brain-focused care is absolutely essential to any neuroprotection paradigm in the 21st century. So lots of people, lots of funding helped to make this all possible, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>